Hey everybody, it's Dinosaur George from DinosaurGeorge.com. Uh, Joseph from Columbus, Ohio said, Dear Dinosaur George, on Jurassic Fight Club, I saw the short-faced bear and the narrator said that on all fours, four legs, it was 12 feet tall and 15 feet long. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's probably close to the size of Magistotherium. How do you compare, or how, how do they compare in size? Uh, I'll tell you this. I think the estimates of size of the short-faced bear, Arctotus simus, uh, I think were bigger than he was in real life. Uh, I think they were a little exaggerated, probably a little bit bigger. We probably pegged him as being bigger than he was. Uh, Magistotherium, on the other hand, is a very big dude. I believe Magistotherium is still bigger, both in mass and power and size. Uh, he is an enormous, an enormous predator, and I, I still think he is the biggest land predator, um, maybe next to Dinohyus, uh, or maybe Dinohyus is, is a little below him. Dinohyus is a giant pig. But Magistotherium, I still believe, is the biggest predatory land mammal, I think. Uh, Nico from Tigard, Oregon. Nico is my good friend. Nico said, hey, August 16th was my birthday and I'll be 15. Happy late birthday to you, Nico. I was wondering if there were any dinosaurs that were discovered on that date. Uh, yes, there was a dinosaur named Nico Raptor. He was a very dangerous little dinosaur. I know he took care of his little kid sister sometimes. Nico Raptor was deadly and he got a job at the zoo and he unfortunately ate uh, a newborn baby elephant and they kicked him out. <laughs> I'm kidding, Nico. No, I don't know if any dinosaur. <laughs> I don't know if any dinosaur was born on your birthday. I wish I would have had time to research it. I would have loved to have to have found one, Nico. But um, maybe someday I'll find a dinosaur and I'll name it Nico Raptor. How's that? All right, uh, my buddy Zach from Mesa, Arizona says, "Hey, dinosaur George, college is only one week away. Good for you, my man." I'm excited. You ought to be. Uh, I do have a question for you. Recently, I heard that the dinosaur Majungatholus is now called Majungasaurus. Is that true? I actually like Majungatholus better because it sounds more unique. You're right. I think Majungatholus is a cooler sounding name than Majungasaurus. But here's what happened. Uh, some paleontologists on the island of Madagascar found the remains of a dinosaur and named it Majungasaurus. Later on, some other paleontologists found bones of what they thought was a new species and they named it Majungatholus. But what they discovered is that the two dinosaurs were actually one and the same. And since Majungasaurus was the first one found, that then became the legitimate scientific name. When they found the second one that they named Majungatholus, it should not have been given a name. So scientists rectified those problems. We see that happen a lot. We see that with the dinosaur named Brontosaurus. The reason why young people today recognize it as Apatosaurus is because that's its true scientific name. The story with that was somebody found some bones, they named it uh, Apatosaurus. Later on, somebody found the remains of what they thought was a new dinosaur, and this one was much more complete than the other one and he named it Brontosaurus. So Brontosaurus got a lot of attention because everybody knew what it looked like, but it wasn't until much later that somebody realized these are the same dinosaurs. It would be like um, your mother names you Zach on the day you were born, and 20 years later I meet you and I decide your name should be Frank. Well, I can give you that name, but that's not your name. Your name was Zach. That's what it was given to you originally, so that's why there's the name difference. Okay, my little friend Hope from Verona, Wisconsin. Uh, she says, hi, Dinosaur George. I was wondering, what did saber-toothed cats look like? Meaning their coat color and pattern. Uh, and then she says, I'm your number one fan. Hope, I know you're my number one fan. You always write that. Thank you for being my number one fan. Here's the problem, Hope. We find the skeleton of saber-toothed tigers and, and prehistoric cats, but unfortunately, we don't find their fur because that decomposes when they die. And so we have absolutely no way of knowing for certain what their color patterns were. But we can look at modern animals and kind of suggest what they look like. Um, if they lived in an environment that was real jungle-like, then chances are they had a spotted coat because that would help break up their silhouette. If they lived in an environment that was big, wide open grasslands, then the possibility exists that they may have been tan like a modern day lion. It's possible that they could have been black. It's possible that they could have been white with black spots. 
The color patterns on animals, especially predators, are designed to hide them or at least make it difficult for an herbivore to pick them out if they're, if they're standing still. My best guess would be that based on the shape of the animal and based on uh, the fact that he's not designed for running great distances, that tells me that he was probably camouflaged, meaning stripes or spots, because he needed to wait until the prey was close enough before he launched an attack. Uh, he's not really going to be a long distance sprinter, and he's not going to stand out in the open because he just doesn't stand a good chance of catching prey. So my best guess is that he's probably spotted, but again, that's simply speculation and nobody knows for certain. Uh, my, my good friend, Zach, from Uniontown, Pennsylvania, he says, first, how am I doing? Zach, I'm doing pretty well. My head is still a little stop, stopped up from the surgery, but I'm doing well. So thank you for asking, man. He said, second, how do people calculate the bite force of dinosaurs? Uh, Zach, brilliant question, buddy. Um, basically, what they can do is there's a series of things. One, we look at the design of the tooth. Let's take Tyrannosaurus rex, for example. We look at the design of their teeth, and we can see that their teeth are very round and sort of blunt. And that suggests that they could apply a tremendous amount of force without breaking the tooth. So tooth design helps right off the bat, because at least it gives us some indication of how much force the tooth could withstand. Second, we look at the jaw design, and we can actually estimate the size of the muscles that connected to the jaw. And by knowing the amount of strength that a muscle has, by looking at modern animals, we can then project how strong that muscle could bite down. So we take the muscle strength, we take the jaw design and the tooth design, and use calculations to help us go, look, I think this jaw I think this muscle could exert X amount of pounds per square inch. The jaw can withstand it. The tooth can withstand it. Therefore, I believe that's how strong this animal could bite. That's kind of sort of how we do it. There's another way to do it as well. Uh, we can actually look at bite marks in the bones of animals and we can measure the depth. And then recognizing the strength of bones compared to modern animals, we can also go, look, how much force would it take to push something that far into that bone? That's another way to give us a good idea. But there's a lot of different ways to be able to do that. But that's kind of sort of how we do it. Okay, Ahmad from Oakville, Ontario writes, Hey, DG, and a lot of people call me DG, and that's fine. He says, my question is, was Spinosaurus the largest meat-eating dinosaur? Well, Ahmad, that's a, that's a cool question. Um, a Spinosaurus appears to have been the longest predator, we think, the longest. But I don't know if you could really consider him to be the largest. And let me explain why. If you took that sail off of his back, he's not, he's not any taller than Tyrannosaurus rex or Giganotosaurus or Rachrocanthosaurus or any of those guys. He's still big, but that sail gives a false impression of size. The other thing to look at is his mass. How heavy was he? How was he built? How was he designed? Giganotosaurus, Maposaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus rex, and uh, Tyrannosaurus batar were all um, uh, much more robust predatory dinosaurs. So I would say Spinosaurus is probably the longest, but uh, in the terms of being the biggest, probably not the biggest. Okay, Justice from Calgary, Alberta. And listen, I love going to Canada for you guys that live in Canada. I love it up there. He said, how many pack members can a Dilophosaurus have? We don't really have evidence that Dilophosaurus was hunting in packs, but based on its shape and size and the environment it lived in, my best guess would be Dilophosaurus probably did hunt in groups because it would have made him more successful. But Dilophosaurus is not really designed for for praying. He may have been more of a scavenger or maybe even a fish catching dinosaur more than anything. But if indeed he did hunt in groups, my guess would be that maybe they hunted in pairs, maybe three at the most. But he's don't, don't really think of Dilophosaurus as sort of like being a raptor-like dinosaur. He's probably living a different life. All right, that's it uh, for this week. Thank you guys so much for writing to me. If you've got questions, go to dinosaurgeorge.com. While you're there, check out all the really cool stuff on my website. Uh, you guys take care of yourselves and make sure and take care of the people around you because we're kind of all on this planet in one big happy family. For you little guys, practice your manners, practice your reading, and I will talk to you all again soon. Take care, everybody. We'll see you.